I'm going to spend uh, half an hour to elaborate on a few things that you have heard uh, through the symposium. Uh, Bill Grubb mentioned that uh, things will be tough. And then, uh, you know, Pete yesterday mentioned that there will be more uh, heterogeneity and more uh, levels of memory hierarchy. So uh, I'm going to couch it as a great opportunity and also a little bit of a sort of apology from my generation uh, to the grad students here. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you will be both excited and also somewhat uh, counseled uh, for the kind of thing, uh, challenges you're going to face. So the, I'm going to first talk about uh, a very exciting revolutionary paradigm shift that I have been seeing uh, between 20th century and 21st century. And then I'm going to talk about this uh, uh, very famous dinar scaling. In fact, um, what happened is that the dinar scaling only lasted for a very small number of years. And um, uh, it turned out that my generation uh, did super dinar scaling for quite a long time. And I'm going to uh, put that into a comparison with our uh, Illinois state government. And then uh, uh, I would uh, give an example of a positive application technology spiral that uh, can be stimulated if we play these kind of uh, you know, the, uh, cases correctly. And then uh, hopefully I'll uh, summarize with lessons learned. But uh, one of the things that uh, for those of us who went to grad school in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, we all have experienced a very interesting shift in paradigm. It uh, happened fairly uh, gradually, but it has been accelerating in the uh, past 10 years. So in the uh, 20th century, we're able to really understand design and manufacture what we can measure. So the instruments that we, you know, we use in the uh, 20th century had tremendous uh, 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 improvement. The telescopes, the, the accelerators, and the, you know, the various light sources that we have, all these physical instruments have been you know, making tremendous progress. And on top of that, we added computing uh, devices to these instruments that uh, we can actually you know, magnify the, uh, the benefit of these instruments. So uh, we're, we're able to see much farther, capture more, uh, communicate better, and understand natural processes. We're able to you know, uh, build network switches that are so much faster than uh, what our predecessors were able to do, and we can control a lot of these processes. When it came to 21st century, something very unique happened, and I, I, I firmly believe that uh, this has to do with the explosion of interest in computer science and then computational science. Um, what's happening is that um, you know, the computational models now become the main driving force, so we're able to understand, design, and create what we can compute. And this is uh, uh, so important because um, the computation models are now the main means for us to be able to see even farther than our uh, instruments were able to help us. And going back and forth in time, there's so many things that, um, you know, uh, we can cheat in so many things, but we cannot cheat in time for physical instruments. But we can actually do that in computation models. And we can test hypotheses in ways that we would never be able to do with uh, physical uh, uh, experiments. And these are the kind of things that computational models are beginning to enable us to do. And we indeed are seeing more and more of these Nobel Prizes given to the projects that are heavily, heavily relying on computational models. So uh, what are the interesting ex uh, you know, examples? Of course, you know, this is a HPC science community. But um, you know, the, the implication is actually much, much um, you know, broad than the uh, this traditional science community. So what we're seeing here, you know, there are several examples that are, have you know, very high economic impact in our society. That um, you know, these, that's why the computation models are used so heavily, and that that's why the com computing is becoming so important part of our society. For example, in the semiconductor industry, in the 21st, uh, in the 20th century, we have you know smaller and smaller masks and patterns that are enabled 
by uh, you know better light sources and uh, you know some computational need and help. But in the 21st century, all the masks used by the micro uh, by the, uh, the, the semiconductor uh, fabrication industry are based on optical proximity correction. And all these patterns are no longer patterns that, are, that you and I would imagine, but these patterns are generated by computational models that truly model the interference of light. By the, uh, be, uh, between the uh, mask and how they hit the semiconductor uh, surface, so that by the time they hit the surface with all the interference, that the patterns are formed correctly. So, um, you know, from the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, biology point of view, we have, you know what, in the 20th century, we have electronic microscope and crystal, uh, crystallography with computational imaging, uh, image processing. But uh, in the 21st century, we're beginning to have computational microscopes where all the observations are truly generated by uh, molecular dynamics level simulation with some initial conditions that are set by the crystallography, you know, the uh, uh, data. And you know, uh, in the medical imaging domain, I'm uh, personally, you know, you know, witnessing some very interesting development where the entire community in the 20th century were focusing on anatomic imaging. Essentially, they are trying to give, give us better and better quality of uh, and visibility into the internals of our body. But in the 21st century, what they're really uh, focusing on is metabolic uh, quantitative imaging. That is, they use statistical models to, uh, to uh, bound the errors so that uh, they can begin to show us the chemical uh, reactions in our body even before any of the um, anatomic changes happen. And this gives us a whole lot more medical you know, the, uh, application than what the, uh, the traditional anatomic imaging did. In, tele, you know, in the communications domain, we have you know, very big progress in terms of teleconferencing in the 20th century, but you, you can see with the, in the 21st century, we're talking about tele-immersion, and the AR, VR is uh, you know, getting tremendous amount of investment you know, for exactly that reason. And uh, in, the, uh, in the sort of public transportation world, in 21st, uh, 20th century, I would like to consider GPS to be a very major breakthrough in you know what, giving us the, uh, the ability to navigate in a way that we were never able to. But it is fundamentally uh, you know, driven by the instrumentation from the satellite. On the other hand, uh, with some you know, uh, uh, extension of uh, you know, uh, path finding and so on in the, uh, in the graph, right? But in the 21st century, we're talking about self-driving cars. We're talking about you know, artificial processes that are uh, you know, truly integrated into a physical process, and the amount of computation is tremendous. And I personally have been involved in several uh, startup companies that are building computational chips that are able to handle the kind of loads for safe uh, you know, self-driving cars. So these are the kind of things that, uh, you know, what, that we were seeing. And this is exactly the reason why it's so exciting to be a grad student today. And um, you know what, I, I still remember uh, when I was a grad student, all of us would get together and complain that um, you know what, the, all, the, all the good work, all the uh, initial papers were published by our advisors and then uh, you know, his and her you know, uh, cohorts before we even got to the grad school, right? So now we, you know, what are we going to do? But uh, this is truly a time where uh, you know, so many of these uh, paradigms are shifting. So many of the, the disciplines are now beginning to switch into first principle-based approach. And so many of these approximations are being eliminated. And so many of these experiments are being you know, either drastically enhanced or even replaced by computational experiments. So the, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, digging into this, but um, you know this is one of the examples that, that I'm personally involved. So I, I have a little bit of a, you know insight into how the computational resource really you know in, make some of these methods into a critical into something that can can be what I call the weight bearing wall. You know something that can truly be used in uh, important experiments. So uh, in computational uh, uh, fluid, uh, molecular dynamics, um, you know, the large-scale uh, clusters are important in making these you know, what, uh, uh, simulations uh, uh, able to handle large systems. 
So the, in, order to, in, in order to be able to get some realistic uh, space resolution, we typically need to have uh, half an angstrom or the 0.05 nanometer uh, lattice spacing in order to get a, a reasonable resolution. But the interesting biological systems have dimensions of millimeters or higher. So this fundamentally drives the size of the system. You know, we really need to have just that much uh, you know, memory and so on to accommodate all the grid space and then all the uh, uh, molecules that we need to be able to simulate. But there's another component, which is seldom mentioned, but is actually critical. It's the fast nodes. Because um, you know what, the, the simulation typically consists of these uh, time steps and molecular dynamics, in order to get meaningful uh, you know, results, we're talking about femtosecond uh, time steps. And the, the rate at which we can make progress in the simulation depends on how fast these nodes are. And um, the biological processes take milliseconds or longer. In, and so uh, when you go from femtosecond time steps into these interesting whole processes, we're talking about you know, days or months of simulation time. And typically, these kind of simulation time can only be improved when we have much faster nodes and uh, rather than much bigger systems. So that's why the, uh, the combination of these much bigger systems plus much faster nodes allowed the computation models to become realistic enough to be able to uh, take the role of uh, you know, what the, the traditional instrument, uh, instrumentation takes. So this is you know, the, the result of, a, the, you know, of that kind of uh, advancement. So now we can begin to study uh, virus in a way that we were never able to study. And I'm sure that uh, there are so many of you who are doing things that are you know, e the equivalent of this in your field. So, so that's the great news. You know, well, we have all this paradigm shift. And so now I have a little bit of confession to make. So the, this is kind of a, uh, a note of apology for my generation, and so I'm going to kind of uh, go through a few slides that um, hopefully will clarify some of the you know, complaints that you may have about the current generation. So the, many, many people mentioned Denar scaling, and, um, and, uh, but very few people actually knew what the Denar scaling really was. And uh, so you know what, I think it's worthwhile to spend one slide to uh, explain what Denar scaling really was. In 1974, uh, Denard uh, and his team from IBM, so the, you know, this is one of the things I always tell my uh, grad students, if there's any kind of uh, major innovation in computing in the 1970s, 1980s, if you don't know where the innovation came from, you have to guess, just guess IBM, okay? it will work. So the, most of the time you will be correct. So uh, you know what? Uh, so the, the team I, from IBM published a, a paper at the Journal of Solid State uh, Circuits, and um, essentially the uh, the team showed uh, two generation of circuits. The first generation circuit, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the first generation circuit uh, is uh, five times uh, bigger than the second generation circuit, and that's the scaling. So the scaling factor in this particular case is 0 0.2 or one over five. So from one generation to the next generation, there was a five time uh, you know, shrinkage of dimensions. And um, what, it, uh, what it did in this particular design, this is an artificial design, but the, it's a design that makes a lot of sense. The team suggested that what we do from one generation to the next generation is we shrink the feature size by a factor of alpha, which is 0 0.2 in this case. And then we shrink the voltage, the supply voltage uh, by alpha, which is you reduce the voltage to one-fifth. And then you also reduce the capacitance by one-fifth. You reduce the current by one-fifth, okay? So this is all tunable parameters, but they suggest that we do so in our circuit design. And what that means is that when you calculate the, uh, the uh, delay, which is the, uh, you know, the amount of charge uh, divided by current, that delay is going to be scaled by alpha. So the, the delay is going to become one-fifth. And therefore, the frequency that you can operate the circuit is going to be one over the delay, which is five times faster. So you have a situation where you have you know, everything shrunk by a uh, factor, and then the clock frequency goes up by that factor. And even more interestingly, if you calculate the power of the chip, if you use exactly the same number of transistors, 
the chip area will be shrunk by alpha square. So the chip area will become 25 times smaller, okay? Or one twenty-fifth of the original chip after the shrinkage. So this will give you a very small chip and very power, much more power efficient than the previous generation, okay? So the, this is great. Or you can choose to build the same size chip, get 25 times more transistors and keep the power the same. Okay, that's also great, right? So this was a great plan. So let me uh, you know, the, the show. A, you know, let me kind of talk about a, a similar plan. There's something called a pension plan. Okay, in the, so the the idea is very simple. You have the existing workers to contribute into the pension plan, and you have a stock market that is going to have some kind of growth. And as in each year, you have some people retire, so you have some payoff. So you know what, you can draw a curve and say, this is where I want the money to be in many, many years from now. And if I am disciplined in terms of the money that goes in, the contribution of the state goes in, and you know, the, we, I'm very good at managing the, you know, the payout uh, from, for the retirees, I will continue to have an increased amount of uh, balance and I'll be able to have a system for everyone. So, here is the reality. So the, you know what, the industry actually stayed with that uh, path from 1974 all the way to somewhere around 1990, okay? And it was, uh, you know, it was a fairly disciplined in our scaling uh, up to about 1990. But starting from 1991, something happened. Some teams, I'm not gonna name companies, I know exactly who they are, but I'm not gonna tell you. So these companies started to realize that the market is very competitive. And some of these companies own their own fabs. So they feel that they can, they can build bigger chips because they can control the yield enough that they can build bigger chips. But keep in mind, building bigger chips is not just from having enough yields to have working chips. Building bigger chips also violated the alpha square scaling that we're talking about. So we are starting to have super dinar scaling by building chips that are over the alpha square scaling and also we're scaling the frequencies because the frequencies were what's selling the chips. So we're also super scaling the frequencies over alpha in every generation. So this is the clock frequency that we ended up. Starting in 1991, we started to have super dinar scaling and we started to take, essentially take away the headroom from the future generations. The Moore's law did not change, okay? The, the speed at which we're, we're shrinking the future size did not change, but we're taking the circuits and scaling the frequency and so on, essentially stealing from the future generation in that whole process. Now you know exactly what I'm gonna say. In the Illinois pension system, you know, started in the uh, late 1980s, probably even mid 1980s, some of the clever politicians realized that there's a big chunk of money in the, the pension system. And they started to realize that nobody will really notice if they don't put money into that pension system. So the state start, started to have less and less contribution into the pension system, hoping nobody will notice. And sure enough, about 20 years later, everybody noticed. And here, we have exactly the same situation. About 12 years after um, the start of the super dinar scaling, everybody noticed. And this is where we are. So the, um, the power of the chips really uh, grew out of, uh, it's supposed to stay, remember that power is supposed to stay constant and you can have you know, what the, uh, the same chip size all through, right? But you can look at this and, and, and tell, how much we stay with that particular discipline. So this is a true testament, this is just one of the true testimony about the collective discipline that human beings are able to have. And the other good example is the pension system. So the, you know, the, we, so this is where we are, and so some of you will ask me, especially the grad students will ask me, is the clock scaling of microprocessors totally ended? And my answer based on this is no. You know, in another 12 years or so, we actually will be able to scale the clock frequency. 
It's not because we're dead. It's because we're so broke that we cannot do it for a few years. Okay, so you know what, that's really what we, where we are. But so the question is, do we sit there for 12 years without any, uh, any, any further improvement, or do we do something about it? The truth of the matter is, the super dinar scaling did not, you know, just go without benefits. There are actually some benefits of that super dinar scaling. The paradigm shift that I talk about is really stimulated, accelerated by that super dinar scaling. So we, are cre we have created a very high appetite for computing power through that process. We addicted the society with computing power. We are training all these, you know, the, the high level CEOs and then the public policy makers, policy makers who assume that the computing power will, be con will continue and the uh, advancement will, con will continue. If you ask someone like Elon Musk, he will tell you he believes the computing power will continue to improve. Otherwise, this company will go under. So these are the kind of things we created, and that's where we are. Okay. So you know what? What are the kind of things that we you know we end up doing? That this is why we had this post dinar scaling pivoting. We are at the point where we're broke. Okay. We don't have much headroom in our technology. Our previous generation, you know, there is a sunk every generation plays the one before, right? So you know, there's a good reason why there's a song about this. You know, that we, we do this all the time. So you know what, so let me just get it over with, okay? I'm here apologizing to all the grad students for what we did in my generation. So let's move on, okay? So uh, the post scenarios of pivoting really involves several things. We cannot improve the clock frequency, so let's just face it. So let's lower the clock frequency and then uh, get into some reasonable uh, range. And then we use very heavy use of execution models that give us very small incremental power cost. Which the one thing that, that we know very well is vector execution. Whenever you have a control unit that, that, that essentially controls a very large number of activities at the same time, the incremental uh, energy cost for doing that execution is very small. Seymour Cray discovered this a long, long time ago. So this is still our main workhorse. If you look at the GPU implementation, if you look at the you know, nice landing implementation, all these things rely heavily on vector execution. And then we use you know, a lot of threading to be able to tolerate that memory latency. But more importantly, we use packaging to cheat. Okay? We actually change the packaging. Remember, we don't have much to play in the scaling anymore. So let's introduce packaging to reduce the latency and improve the, uh, the, um, the bandwidth of memory without tapping much into the memory channels and the, cost, uh, the energy cost. So that's why the 3D packaging is so important because we are broke in this other uh, domain. So these are the kind of things that we're seeing, and this is exactly the reason why Peter was talking about that increased level of memory hierarchy uh, yesterday. We're, Cray's future is going to heavily depend on the use of 3D packaged memory, which is of limited size, about 16 megabytes, into, onto the chip so that they could have the memory bandwidth they need. But then we're broke in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the power for DRAM, so we're going to resort to non-volatile memory, which is you know, much, much more memory, memory uh, energy efficient, but about two times slower, and there's some reliability issues. So we're going to build a very, very big non-volatile memory pool underneath that package. Essentially, they're going to squeeze out DRAM if they can. So you know, this is kind of you know, how, how they're going to do, uh, play it out in the next few years. But as far as you're concerned, your application is going to see increased level of memory hierarchy that somehow someone needs to deal with in order to be able to, you know, to really get the benefit of the, uh, the bandwidth improvement and so on. So, Blue Waters, what the, we have a, you know what, the, a system of the 12.5 petaflops, and um, we are exactly in the, at, uh, we were at exactly the beginning of that Denard pivoting, uh, post-Denard pivoting. So uh, we have CPUs, 
who are still uh, latency-oriented design, high clock frequency, fairly high clock, and then um, you know a large caches to convert the, the low latency memory accesses to short latency cache accesses. We have sophisticated control. We have branch prediction. We have data forwarding, and fairly powerful CPUs. The floating point multiply will typically take about two clock cycles. That's a you know, that's a fairly um, you know uh, uh, high. Uh, energy uh, power design to be able to cut down the latency. Whereas the GPUs are throughput oriented design, exactly the pivot that I was talking about. And um, moderate clock frequency, about less than half of the clock frequency of the CPU. Small caches, mostly to really as a staging unit to collect the memory uh, accesses so that you can use the, the essentially the long vector access in the memory system properly. And simple control, no branch prediction, no data forwarding, energy efficient ALUs. These things take many cycles to, uh, in a pipeline way to, uh, uh, to generate execution results. So this requires massive number of threads, and many of you had to work very hard to get your application into that kind of state to be able to use uh, the GPUs. So <laughs> this is the uh, experience that we have using uh, uh, the GPUs in Blue Water so far. These results are based on real applications, and the measurements are done at the full application level. That is, it includes the I/O, includes you know what the pre, uh, from beginning to end, and um, you know we're talking about somewhere around two to five times you know a better uh, execution time than using a dual CPU node alone. So, in uh, in many ways, we have proved that these things can work for real applications. But we have not proved that all the applications can use this technology. And we still have work to do. We still have ways to go. So here, let me just kind of give you a little bit of a glimpse about the, you know, what, what I see as some of the you know, interesting uh, trends um, coming, you know, coming our way in the future. So <coughs> many of you, you know, have been you know, the, um, interested in um, you know, uh, data science and deep learning and so on. So here's a very interesting piece of history. And um, uh, computer vision is one of the fields that have been around for many, many years. And one of the grand challenges in that field is that nobody knows exactly how to do it. We still don't know exactly how the human vision works. We still don't know what are the, the, all the important algorithms or important you know, the capabilities that we need to put into a computer vision system to be able to achieve the vision that is close to human. So uh, traditionally, uh, people actually craft these, you know, what the functions, computer vision functions with uh, all kinds of interesting feature extraction capabilities and all kinds of interesting, uh, you know, what the uh, uh, boosting methods and so on to be able to try to, try to you know, get to the level of human uh, vision. And um, so uh, on the right-hand side, I'm showing you know, what the, from, uh, the ImageNet competition results. Um, the y-axis shows the uh, accuracy, and the x-axis shows time. So uh, you, you can see that from 2010, um, you know, there were all these you know, essentially uh, algorithm-based you know, large number of feature extractors and so on to be able to, you know, to get some kind of good results, somewhere around 70% um, or so. In 1992, something very interesting happened. So the Jeffrey Hinton, uh, Hinton's group at the University of Toronto trained a, a neural net with 1.2 million uh, images. And training a neural net with 1.2 million images is not a small feat. So what they did was they used GPUs. And the more interesting part, from my perspective, is that in 2010, you know, I was teaching this GPU programming class, and there was a professor called uh, Andreas Moshomis from uh, uh, Toronto who contacted me and said, you know, can I use your course material? And I said, of course, Andreas. And I knew him when he was a grad student at uh, Wisconsin. So you know what, feel free to, to, to use anything. So he created a course in Toronto in 2010, and then um, he taught a few students from Jeffrey Hinton's group, and uh, you know what, they trained them how to use GPUs, and you know, guess what? They built that uh, neural net stuff in the next two years that was actually started as a course project in that course, and the rest of this thing is history because after 2012, we all know that set off a whole revolution in terms of computer vision in the industry. We're not talking about billions of dollars invested by Google and then Facebook and you know, Baidu and so on. And so this, 
you know, these kind of revolution can be set off by people in this, by the people in this kind of room. Okay, it can start with a grad school, graduate class. It can it can start with a num small number of students who are inspired to do something, who wanted to you know to be able to take the technology challenges and make a difference. Okay, so enough of that. So more heterogeneity is coming beyond traditional CPUs and GPUs. And uh, we're, you know, what the, uh, I've been uh, talking to the Microsoft, uh, you know, uh, FPGA cloud uh, fairly regularly, and uh, uh, Derek Chu and uh, uh, Doug Berger, and uh, ASICs, the Google, you know, what the, uh, T, the TPU team and so on, we're seeing more and more of the compute heterogeneity coming in. And then uh, they were also beyond the traditional DRAM, and I think, I really think that that heterogeneity is going to be of primary importance to this group. So we're going to really need to, uh, to, to uh, think about how we're going to be able to take advantage of stack DRAM and more memory bandwidth and then the non-volatile memory for memory capacity and near memory and in-memory in uh, acceleration or computing for reduced power consumption and uh, data movement. So here's the summary. Okay, so hopefully this half an hour, you, you, know, you all had to get up early to, to come to this talk. I really appreciate you uh, coming to this talk. And um, you know, so I want, to, I want you to walk away with three thoughts. One is supercomputing using GPUs can result in two to three times, occasionally five times, of real application um, you know, level performance improvement for HPC. And the GPUs and big data and deep learning have formed a very positive spiral. And I really think that that's a model that uh, you know, what most of the grad students should be thinking about in terms of your field. And thirdly, this is an exception time to be a grad student. Paradigm shift, partly thanks to the generation of super dinar scaling, is creating all these expectations opportunities for all of you. And, but you have to work much harder. You're gonna to have to work much harder than my generation because partially thanks to the generation of super dinar scaling, we took away the easy things from you. Okay, thank you very much.